Hello there, this is a video if you're interested in the European Research Council grants, the Starting Consolidator and Advanced Grant. And in this video I'm going to talk about how I won an um, Advanced Grant in the 2015 competition. And if this is of interest to you, stick around. So first of all, a bit of a disclaimer, I have a sample size essentially of one. I mean, I'm uh, trying again with other um, ERC grant proposals now, but I think uh, in the end there was one successful one. So for whatever that's worth, I'm going to share what I thought contributed to the success of this particular proposal. Also for the purposes of this video, I assume you know the basics of this particular funding scheme and the different components that go into this grant. And the resources are actually quite good on the ERC webpage, so I'm not going to go over that. I'm just going to go more over the experience of writing this grant, because that is something that you don't readily get from the ERC webpage or others. The first step, of course, if you're going for any of these grants, but in particular for the ERC Advance Grant, is a critical self-assessment. This goes for all of the other levels of the ERC as well. I mean, are you in that group that they are describing? They are describing a particular target group, and, you know, this can be a unpleasant experience if in the end you come up with the decision that maybe you're not in the target group yet, maybe you have to wait a little bit. I mean, I did write an ERC Advance Grant when I was just at the very beginning of the time window of when you go for an ERC advanced grant in terms of time since your PhD. And that was essentially a waste of time. I mean, at the time, the advising infrastructure at the university wasn't as matured yet. And so I, I had nobody around to tell me that, don't bother. I mean, just wait a couple of years, then maybe you're going to be in that window where you have a real opportunity. So I think if your university has uh, these advising infrastructure ready, then by all means, take advantage of that. Ask colleagues, ask colleagues that have won one of these grants, or ask your friends and connections in other European countries, for example, that have some experience with that. And, and also use um, their help to uh, assess if you're actually in the target group. And if you decide, <laughs> if you come to the conclusion you're not in the target group yet, don't do it because it's a massive amount of work and you don't want to do it until you're ready. Now, um, in B1, of course, you have your track record and you have an extended sort of a CV and they are the various points that you're supposed to have. They give you, for example, already a very good hint of what they're looking for, but you can also look um, into the description of the kind of um, expertise they're looking for and the, and the kind of standing of you as a scientist. So it shouldn't really come as a surprise, but still it's important to get that outside help. Now, if you decide to go for an ERC grant, I think it doesn't matter which one, I can only speak for the <laughs> ERC advanced grant, you should know that this is going to be a major, major effort in terms of time and energy, a major effort. And it, it drains your energy. It's not a regular grant, right? I mean, this, this is two and a half million. So I mean, our funding agency, DFG, and national funding agency in the equivalent, this would be about, you know, about 10 of these grants. So this is, a, this is a big grant and they want some big ideas and they are difficult to come up with. And this all takes a lot of energy to actually write. And all this energy you then don't have for other things you need to do as well. You're not gonna write that one on the side unless you're a genius, <laughs> but this is going to be actually a major uh, effort in terms of time to get uh, one of these grants together. And so think of this very carefully. <laughs> the second general point is you need to start way early, way early. I think if you have already sort of the general idea and sort of the skeleton of this proposal down, I would still give myself six months. I mean, it's not like you can take a vacation and write that grant, right? I mean, you still have your other stuff to do as well as a faculty member. So I think six months is sort of the, the minimum you need to uh, get this grant written. Remember also that you're in, in essence, you're writing two grants. I mean, you're writing B2, which is the 15 page proposal, which people will only see, as you know, once you've passed sort of the first stage of the evaluation. Otherwise they won't even, nobody will even read that part. You have to write that. That, of course, takes a massive amount of effort. But then you also have to write B1, which is this executive summary of just five pages, which sounds easy. Oh, it's just five pages. But you got to remember that you basically got to trans transfer most of the information from that 15 grand proposal into this five pages. And that is an extremely painful, time-consuming process. Uh, you may have to do some custom writing, some, rust, uh, some custom display items even. And um, it is a lot of effort that goes into the writing these two pieces. Uh, don't underestimate that. Also the 10-year track record and your past grants and whatever. 
putting all this information together, it just takes time. And so you need to start way early, I'd say at least six, allow yourself at least six months for this, maybe even longer before the target date. Also think if, you know, it ha always helps to have preliminary data to prove some of your major points. Um, and so maybe you, you need to do a, a quick experiment or some quick trial to, you know, alleviate some of the major risks in your proposal. And again, you need to plan ahead and that, that takes time. Now, in terms of the overall strategy, it seems you need to be high risk. You cannot just write your normal proposal you would write for a national funding agency. That does not work. I also have an N of one for this. So you need to think like bigger and on a, on a grander scale because, you know, this is a, this is a huge grant. And so I think you cannot just go for pure high risk. I think it's good to throw in some things in there that also, you know, are on that label trust us, like we can do this. But a lot of the things have to be in the category, whoa, if this really worked, it would be amazing. This has got to be a lot of that grand. Actually, that was one of the amazing experience from the reviewer comments. The reviewer comments I got not every time, but the one time I got funded, were more like, if this really worked, this would be cool because thus, this and this would be basically found out. So that the spirit of those reviewers was more like, this is, a, this is a really great idea. What if that actually worked? So it was not about, you know, nitpicking little bits of the, the methods, but it was more like, if this really worked, how great would that be? Or would it be just normal research, just normal science? Would it just be incremental work with a steady progress that you could do also with a bunch of national grants? I think that will be the end. It will be rejected. But I think it, there needs to be some element in there that's so cool <laughs> that it makes it over that threshold. Of course, what is that threshold is totally subjective, right? By and large. Yeah, no idea how to actually balance that right. But you definitely got to give this some thought, you know, is this a grandiose idea of that scale? Do you really need a grant like that? Or can you basically do this maybe slightly less cool and less sophisticatedly also with a bunch of regular grants from your national funding agency? So have this sort of balance between trust us, we can do this and this would be amazing if it worked, but it is high risk and make sure you have a, a solid mix of those two. And of course, coming up with ideas like that is just hard. It's really hard work, right? And, and I think start from the time you have this idea and then, then let, let's count these six months. But I think coming up with an idea like this is, is not an idea you like you have every day. I mean, it takes a lot of work to come up with this idea in the first place and test it and think it through and, you know, convince yourself that you can write like a proposal that is a five-year proposal on this particular topic. Now, how about writing this? So you have a, the B1 and the B2. The B2 is the 15-page proposal. B1 is the five-page executive summary. So the first time I wrote it, and this was actually the one I get funded, I, I wrote them both in parallel. I always went back and forth. And so then I, um, you know, it may have had the advantage that I didn't be, I, I wasn't very wordy because I was maybe a slightly, slight bit more wordy, a little bit more wordy in the B2 part, but then I was forced to sort of cut it further down in B1, and then I actually, what I liked in B1, I liked, so then I actually pasted that back into B2, because it was more succinct, succinct language, and it just, um, it just read better, and it uh, left more space to explain other things. So I, I basically simultaneously wrote uh, the B1 and B2 part. So when I just did it again, I did it not like that. I just focused completely on the B2 part, made sure that was all done. And that when that was all done, and I had sent it then to some colleagues maybe to look at, then I completely wrote the B1 part as an abstract of the, of the B2. That was an extremely painful experience. It also took um, quite a while and it seemed like this is not gonna, this is not gonna work. <laughs> but in the end, I had this thing wrestled down to those five pages without hopefully losing too much of the information that was in the 15 pages. So 
Yeah, so maybe you can try one of those two modes. Um, I did them both. They're both difficult. I'm not sure what I would recommend now. I think there was some advantage to writing them simultaneously and going back and forth and, and sort of um, increasing the level of the writing in both parts that way. Uh, but there was also something set for just concentrating on writing this one 15 page thing. Uh, just like a regular grant is also normally 15 pages. And once you have that, then go for the executive summary bit. Both work. Now, I think it's important to send the draft out to some friends and colleagues or some professionals that help with these grants and or your research department at your university. I did all of them. And so I think from, from all of those, you get some useful feedback. You get also feedback from people that are not exactly in your field, which is important because most likely on the panel, there's going to be people that are not exactly in your uh, field of expertise. So if it doesn't make sense to them because you use some language that you know, to you it seemed clear, but others simply didn't get what you meant, then that can be, well, that can be decisive in terms of not getting, getting it um, over the level, over the minimum level to advance to the next stage. And so I think that is um, quite useful to send it to some people to review. Um, and that means you need to allow time, right? Like you cannot send this proposal to somebody and expect to get a revision or some comments back in one or two days. You need to give people some time because they're also busy. And so it's important that you therefore have like a first pretty solid finalized draft ready to send your friends, colleagues, or like a professional agency to look at this proposal. Which means, you know, <laughs> you have to start early as I have said before. So you then have some time when all this comes back to revise it. And sometimes it may mean you need to restructure or at least substantially uh, revise some bits. And that was definitely the case because some things that were clear to me in writing this proposal and having thought about this topic for years, basically, they were clear to me. But when I had written them down, obviously other people simply did not get them. And so therefore it was important to get that feedback and the feedback is important in making it a better proposal. And of course you can do that ad infinitum. You can always you know, get more feedback. At some point you just got to call it a day. I don't know when that day is, <laughs> but at some point I just didn't want any more feedback and just like, okay, this is closed and now I'll just finalize it. But it's important. It will always get better. I mean, there's no doubt if you send it to somebody to look at, even in your, in your research department, I got great comments from them as well. It'll make it. It'll make it sharper. You know, there is like bits and pieces that maybe were not clear, or even if it's typos or anything, everything makes it better. So uh, I never do that with other proposals. I have to admit. I mean, I only do it with ERC, but there, you know, I'm trying to get it right. And so I think again, that means you have to be done ahead of time, so you can do that, and you have to. You allow sufficient time for other people to comment on your proposal. And then you have sufficient time to act on these. Because if you do that just one or two days before the deadline, it simply is not going to happen. Huh? So I think you need to just plan ahead sufficiently. Now, another piece of advice is pretty clear. I think in all proposals these days, spend time on the figures. We spend a lot of time on these figures. We make sure that they are as, as brilliant as they can be, basically, and as, as clear as they can be. And so they help complicated bits, uh, help out in complicated bits of your, of your proposal when it's, con when it's either conceptually difficult or when the experimental design is far from the normal experimental design. I think it just helps to have these illustrations in there. And they take just a lot of time. And so I think, but it's important to get them right. I think this is true for virtually every proposal these days. And it's especially true for the ERC, I'm convinced. Well, those are sort of my general tips. I think if it doesn't work, you know, try again. There's these <laughs> stories I've seen on Twitter from people that tried many times. For this one individual, I think he tried, uh, he tried seven times. I can't remember exactly until it finally worked. And um, this can be, of course, qu quite frustrating. I'm not sure how many times I would be prepared to try it. But um, also when you get some comments and some feedback, then usually is, is quite good. I mean, the review process is, is, works, I think, quite well. And so they point out the things that don't work. And also they point out the things that, that seem to be very good. And so you can then refine it. Huh? You don't start from scratch. So I think it's not as Herculean an effort that you had to put in when you put this together from scratch the first time. And even if you just you know, take some parts that mm, didn't go over well with reviewers, for example, and toss them, and put another module in basically another work package or whatever to replace it. 
I think the, the effort is not quite as massive as uh, writing it completely from scratch. So I guess don't get discouraged if it doesn't work. I mean, the chances are really low to get these funded depending on the year. And, um, you know, very few in any given discipline are funded. So I think it's important to not let a rejection deter you and try again. And with that, good luck with your ESC grant. I hope you get it. See you in the next video. Bye.